Hey everyone, a great conversation today on your health and your microbiome. And it's with William Davis, MD, author of the Wheat Belly series of books. So he's a super smart cardiologist, incredible researcher, and he's gone deeply into all aspects of health. And today he focuses on the microbiome. So just another couple of quick things in advance. Uh, really appreciate all my PayPal and Patreon supporters. Very important to have independent technical expert analysis and uh, sharing of knowledge in these difficult times of censorship. To that end, I've already shown you guys that some of my more uh, deep material on viral issue, etc., is over on the Odyssey platform. So I'm not really going to get into any of that here. I think it's just become too problematic. And one other thing I've got, or I don't have, there's a new team I'm working with who have a new YouTube channel, uh, Imagine That. And my last video uh, has given an intro, and great if you could head over to that channel, uh, watch the intro video there, subscribe, give a thumbs up, give a comment on what you think or topics you'd like to see covered on that new 10 minute or so viral video type channel. So with that, enjoy Bill Davis and his incredible research on the microbiome and how it can help you. Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. Hey guys, another fascinating uh, metabolic and health-based pod. And I'm here down in my Southern Ireland kind of bolt hole, so I'm on location. But I've got a very special guest, uh, a friend of mine, um, delighted to have back on the podcast, Dr. William Davis of Wheat Belly fame. And today we're gonna talk microbiome. So great to see you again, Bill. Same here, Ivor. Glad to be back. Yeah, it's good. It doesn't seem like that long ago, but it's been a while. Uh, but you, you did mention in reasonable depth microbiome, the yogurts, the cultures, as far as I recall, back last time we talked. But now you've, con you've gone in much deeper and there's tons of data exploding is the impression I get from the whole microbiome field. You know, I, my motivation for doing this, going down this path, Ivor, was... So people on the wheat belly lifestyle, that is, we eliminate all wheat and grains, this thing added only recently to the human dietary experience. And then we address the nutrients that are largely lacking in modern life, like magnesium, because we drink filtered water, you don't drink from a stream or river, uh, iodine, because we don't eat the thyroid glands of animals. Most of us are not coastal because the iodine of the, of the planet is in the ocean. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids, because we don't eat brains of animals anymore, and it's, it's tough to eat enough fish and shellfish because of mercury and cadmium exp uh, exposure. And so just doing those basic things yielded extraordinary benefits. People would lose large amounts of weight. Many type 2 diabetics became non-diabetic. Many pre-diabetics became non-pre-diabetic. Many autoimmune diseases receded. Many neurodegenerative disorders receded. But there are still people who had residual problems. So a common story would be, I lost 57 pounds, but I'm still 40 pounds overweight. I still need to lose 40 pounds, but I plateaued. Or my uh, rheumatoid arthritis or other autoimmune disease is better. I'm off the stupid biologic agent. I'm off prednisone, but I'm having flare-ups now and then. I have to go back on the indomethacin or the naproxen. I have to occasionally go back on steroids. So, so I asked the question, why? Why did people enjoy such extraordinary benefits Yet there are many people who had were left with some residual health problem. And so I looked to the microbiome for answers. And lo and behold, Ivor, there were a ton of answers. And at a time when modern people have massively disrupted the microbiome for, for a variety of reasons, antibiotic exposure, you know, in the U.S. by age 40, most people have taken 30 courses of antibiotics. So we've massively disrupted the microbiome because of antibiotics, overuse of antibiotics. You know, in the US, uh, the herbicide Roundup is uh, dispensed like water by farmers and by people on their lawns. So the active ingredient glyphosate, which is an herbicide is also an antibiotic. When Monsanto filed its patents for glyphosate as an herbicide, they also filed patents as an antibiotic not knowing it was an antibiotic of the worst kind because it's effective against healthy bacterial species, 
and it's ineffective against pathogens. <laughs> In other words, glyphosate, now ubiquitous, air, water, soil, clothes, blood, <laughs> cord blood of, of a newborn, it essentially selects for unhealthy bacterial species. And then, of course, other things, emulsifying agents in foods like peanut butter and salad dressings and ice cream, emulsifiers like polysorbate 80 and carboxymethylcellulose, synthetic sweeteners like aspartame and diet sodas. In other words, we swim in a sea of factors that disrupted the human microbiome. And I, when we look at that issue, in people who failed to obtain full restoration of health, we find all kinds of problems. But then the question is, what the heck do we do about it? Yeah, that's it, million dollar question. But uh, well, uh, as you well know, the engineer finds the root cause and then solution usually follows because if you're smart enough to figure out a complex root cause, you're going to be smart enough to find out a solution, uh, which I'm absolutely expecting you have. <laughs> and uh, I must admit, yeah. Bill, I, oh, I, the microbiome, I did a little work here and there, but I was always happy it was crucial, but I kind of made the decision just with my bandwidth and other, other priorities to accept that everything that I would focus on to fix the problems would largely relieve the microbiome. But you're talking about going further than that and I guess replenishing and nurturing it, not just taking away the problems that damage it. Right, because one of the difficulties in restoring what we think is a healthy microbiome is when you lose species, you don't get them back. In other words, if you don't plant zucchini in your garden, you won't have zucchini coming up in the springtime, right? So we have to replace these lost microbes. And by the way, part of the solution, a crucial piece of the, of the solution came from Dublin, Ireland. So Dr. Angus Short, uh, in Dublin, Ireland, who had his girlfriend at the time, now his wife, had irritable bowel syndrome, and she was told to go on a low FODMAPS diet, essentially a low fiber, low sugar diet, because when people with uh, irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, do that, they have less bloating and diarrhea. So he saw how difficult it was. By the way, that's a stupid solution. <laughs> that's another story. Um, but he saw how difficult it was for her to navigate a diet that was low in FODMAPs. So he invented this device called the AIR, A-I-R. I have no relationship. It's just a cool device. He's a smart guy. He's a good guy and a good project. It's called the AIR device, A-I-R-E. It talks to your smartphone via Bluetooth. And it helps you determine uh, how high up in the GI tract bacteria are living. In other words, so bacteria are supposed to stay in their own neighborhood, which is the colon, which is 24 feet down from the mouth. But if you eat something that bacteria convert to hydrogen gas, that's what this thing detects, hydrogen gas. Let's say I eat something that bacteria can convert to hydrogen gas, but I register positive on this device at say 30 minutes or 45 minutes, the bacteria must be high up. And I've, I thought that issue, so-called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, I thought it was a rare thing. So when I wrote my wheat belly books, undoctored books, I, I thought, you know, see, well, yeah, yeah, it's there, but eh, it's not that common. Now that we have a consumer device and we have millions of people using it, Ivor, it's everywhere. It's shocking how many people test positive. Now, the, one of the problems, as with carnary calcium, you ask your doctor, John Q. Primary Care, hey, doc, what about my carnary calcium score? What about hydrogen gas in my small bowel? They say, oh, we'd be talking to Dr. Google again. Or, <laughs> or don't waste my time with that BS. It's not a, you're fine. We did an endoscopy and colonoscopy. We didn't see anything. All the stupid stuff my colleagues say because they're 30 years out of touch because of the realities of education and practice. And so th this problem, I think, if we do some simple arithmetic uh, in the U.S., and I think the same is largely true in Western Europe, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, the overgrowth of bacteria that now occupy 30 feet, 30 feet of small bowel and colon is epidemic. Easily, easily, you can uh, add up over 100 million people in the U.S. alone 
who have this problem. Because all you have to do is look at all the evidence, the existing evidence, not my evidence, other people's evidence, that of the 70 million people with uh, obesity in the U.S., 70 million, 50% have been shown to have SIBO. Well, that's 35 million people right there. Of the 50% of Americans who have fatty liver, so 50%, around 160, 170 million people, 50% of them have SIBO. Well, that's another what? 70 million? It's a huge. Now, there's overlap, of course, obese people with yeah. diabetes and fatty liver. There's a lot of overlap. But if you do the math, <clears throat> you'll see that it's easy to exceed in the US alone over 100 million people, one in three Americans. And the availability of this simple device is bearing this out that it's it's the it's almost the exception i have an online program where you talk about these things every every wednesday night we have a two-hour conversation talk about these things it's the exceptional person who tests negative to my great mm-hmm. surprise but it also as you it's like coronary calcium if you have something to track measure and track you now have something to give you feedback on the value, the effectiveness of your program. And that's what's happening. Yeah. And it's like the CGMs, though, I think, to be honest, pricking with a glucose meter, the cheap option is, is nearly as good. But yeah, can you imagine you took that air device to the Katavans or to any ancestral population or the Inuits or the Maasai eating all the milk and meat uh, years ago? Uh, you're just, you're just not going to get a hit. And you know, it's funny, uh, Bill, but this, this is a memory from a good few years back. I remember reading a small paper and it was exactly about that. It might have even been the Dublin guy. I could never find it afterwards. But they went in and they were looking at the hydrogen and looking at the amount of hydrogen in a cohort of people. And you expect to see it after an hour and you could look at the amount. But the shock they got is some of their people, they could see it in 10 minutes. <laughs> And they actually came to the conclusion, they realized the bacteria are migrating so far up and it's almost like they're, they're, they're going for the source of the sugar and the carbohydrates and the crap, right? They're moving up to where the, the stuff comes in. And one last thing I'll say on that, GGT, gamma glutamyl transferase, the liver enzyme, classic insulin resistance, fatty liver, diabetes marker. Uh, that's what got me into this. My GGT was high. But funny enough, I went on and on about GGT and gave little talks on it for years. But a guy wrote to me and he said, I have an interesting story for you, Ivor. I had GGT up around 60, 65 for around 10 years. And he said, my doctor, because all the doctors think GGT, alcohol. It was so infuriating. My doctor kept saying, oh, come on now, you must be having too much to drink. And he says, I don't drink. I have a, a beer every couple of weeks, honestly. Doctor wouldn't believe him. Like you said, doctor, nah, alcohol. And eventually he actually worked it out. He got loads of tests and guess what he had? SIBO. He had small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, particularly bad bacteria. He got a specialized antibiotic and a bunch of other stuff. And for the first time in nearly 20 years, his GGT went right down. So it was some kind... And that's such a rare case, but GGT is a non-specific marker, and I guess it also reflects inflammatory or other problems that can relate to that. But he fixed it himself. That's great. And that's becoming the story where people, you know, the, the medical system, I, I think it's worse in the U.S. where the healthcare system is so profit-driven. Mm. And so uh, healthcare here has become this business that is serving its own purposes, that is driving revenue by dispensing products and procedures for for internal benefit, the doctors, the healthcare executives. And so if if we can't count on my colleagues to help you become healthy, you got to do it yourself. And that's what's great about this. As we have these new devices and information that empower people, one of the problems that come up is, as you point out, what do you do? And by the way, that would be so cool to do a H2 breath test in a, in a in a uh, hunter-gatherer population, that would be really interesting. But no one's done that to my knowledge. But what do you do when you have 30 feet of bacteria? One of the things for people to recognize is a very crucial observation made by uh, a Belgian group, a French, now Belgian group, uh, led by Dr. Patrice Kenny. And in 2007, they made a very important observation. That is, that when you have 30 feet of bacteria, 
that live and die in rapid succession. They don't live 70 years. They live like hours, maybe days at tops. So there's a huge turnover of trillions of microbes that when they die, some of their debris, some of their breakdown products enter the bloodstream. And that's the process called endotoxemia. But it, that explains how microbes in the GI tract can be manifested as a skin rash like rosacea or psoriasis or as joint swelling and pain like rheumatoid arthritis or thyroid inflammation as Hashimoto's thyroiditis or depression in the brain or as Alzheimer's dementia or Parkinson's disease in the brain. In other words, uh, it was never quite clear how bowel microbes could be responsible for something far distant in the brain, skin, joints, or other places, in the heart as atrial fibrillation or coronary disease. And so it's become clear that virtually all human disease has to be re, uh, uh, reconsidered, redefined in light of this new finding that there are microbial, gastrointestinal microbial contributions or even outright causes of many of these conditions. Yeah, and, and that ties in to the thing that, of course, the medical profession uh, don't really agree with. So everything that's important and fundamental to these complex root causes, usually the medical system, which is a, you know, it's a profit system, uh, kind of poo-poos it or debunks it or pushes it down like vitamin D, oh, vitamin D, blah, blah, blah. But leaky gut is another one they don't like. And yet it's the leakiness in those tight junctions combined with the wrong type of bacteria that allows endotoxins into the bloodstream where it can cause the, isn't there that kind of plaque has an element sometimes of that uh, kind of nano slime where the bacteria can cause a shield and protect themselves from your immune system and then everything else you mentioned. So to get your gut non-leaky could be one of the most important things, along with, of course, getting the right flora in your... Uh, so what, the solution, <laughs> I'm waffling. We need, we need to hit the solution. What's the solution in your mind? Well, as you point out, the conventional solution among this small minority of my colleagues who even are, think this is a problem, which is mm. very few, most primary care physicians and even gastroenterologists will say things like, there's no such thing as SIBO, or this insufficient evidence, or all the all the other ridiculous things they come up with. Uh, so, it, but even if they do know something about it, all they'll do is prescribe an antibiotic, such as rifaximin, and which is very costly. It's not covered by insurance here, and it's about forty to sixty percent effective. So, there's common uh, persistence of the SIBO. There's common recurrences. And all they do is give you repeated rounds of rifaximin. It's just, it's it's ridiculous. Don't tell you how you got it. Don't tell you how to prevent recurrence. So uh, I was skeptical, Ivor, that herbal antibiotics would work, but uh, because they're just haphazardly created. You take, mm -hmm. let's say, oil of oregano, which is effective maybe against E. coli, throw that together with some other things, or effective against staphylococcus, and that's your herbal. So I was very uh, uh, skeptical. But there was a study from Johns Hopkins where they compared rifaximin versus two herbal antibiotic regimens and showed the herbal antibiotic regimen were as good as and probably superior to refaction. So I started using that and it was, it, and it's reasonably effective. These two are, one is called candibactin AR and BR, other ones called FC Cidal with dysbiocyte, they're commercial products. But I also asked this question because I wasn't quite satisfied with that. I asked, you know, so if you and I take a commercial probiotic, that is a haphazardly concocted mixture of microbes because somebody says, oh, you know, we think that lactobacillus infantis, I'm sorry, bifidobacter bacteria infantis is, is helpful for humans. We think that lactobacillus brevis is helpful. Let's throw them all together and call it a probiotic. Well, in other words, they're just kind of haphazardly created. So I asked a different question. I asked, well, what if we chose species and strains that have effects that are likely against the species of SIBO, such as they take up residence in the upper GI tract, that's where SIBO occurs. And they, and they as you point out, they produce a so-called biofilm for long-term residents, and they produce what are called bactericides. These are natural antibiotics effective against the species of SIBO, like E. coli and Klebsiella. 
So I chose three species, Lactobacillus gasseri, strain of Lactobacillus gasseri, strain of Lactobacillus rotori, and um, Bacillus coagulans. We make yogurt out of it. Not people get confused because they say, what, can I just go to the store and buy yogurt? No. <laughs> That's sugar. <laughs> Wait, the yogurt you buy in the store is sugar with the fat taken out, bad as it gets. <laughs> and it's fermented, so bacteria uh, double. They have so-called asexual reproduction. They don't have mommy and daddy. There's no male and female bacteria, right? They just double. So one bacteria becomes two, two becomes four, and so on. And so in commercial yogurt production, they allow fermentation for four hours typically. And roiterite, for instance, lactobacillus roiterite requires three hours to double. So if you only ferment for four hours, you've got almost nothing. So I fermented for 36 hours, 12 doublings. We perform flow cytometry, a cell count method on our yogurts, about uh, 12 runs. And we're getting about 260 billion counts. So very high bacterial counts in a half cup serving. Uh, so we co-ferment these three organisms. I call it SIBO yogurt. Now this is very preliminary, Ivor. So it's not, I have not done the formal study. This is like 20 people. Over 90% normalize their hydrogen gas production with this yogurt made of three microbes, three different species, um, uh, fermented to high counts. So I'm, I'm remaining hopeful. This may be a really important finding. We, we need to formally prove this, but it makes sense that these microbes that take up residence upper GI tract form their own biofilms for long-term residence and in, produce bacteria. Since the lactobacillus gasseri, it's a strain called BNR17 in particular, is a bacteriocin powerhouse. It produces seven known bacteriocins, antibiotics. In other words, you're making, you're getting microbes that take care of it yourself. Some of these microbes are so powerful. I, I know several microbiologists and they tell me, you know, they, they ferment their bacteria in these big stainless steel vats. And when they want to clean the vats, they sometimes use lactobacillus rotori to clean the vats because Whoa. it's such a potent antibacterial bacteria that it actually kills other microbes. And so that's one of the components of this so-called SIBO yogurt. And by the way, Ivor, it's, it's delicious, thick, rich, <laughs> and goes great with blueberries. <laughs> and so it's a very soft way to, I think, push back SIBO. Yeah, no, and it sounds perfect. And again, it's not introducing even herbal medicines or, or kind of any form of drug or even a smell of a drug. It's pure natural, which is fantastic. That's as good as it gets. And, you know, if you, if you do something like you test something out and it works, okay, it could be luck, it could be, you know, might not reproduce or replicate. But if all the mechanisms make sense and you arrived at this kind of uh, intervention, and all the science lined up, and then it gives a good result, you know, you're highly likely onto something really, really solid. So it sounds fantastic. And that's something I do myself, actually. I'm not great for taking vitamins and minerals. I'm good for kind of getting some exercise and being low carb and some things like that. And I'm also good. I have a sun bed, uh, kind of a semi-pro one, and one I made myself with 12 reptile lamps. And I have the two of them together. So I get my UV. So I'm brown in the winter. <laughs> and I think that's important for vasodilation and not just for vitamin D. It's good. Uh, but this sounds like one that will be so easy to do and nothing like taking your cod liver oil. Quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits, so uh, one of the reasons why lactobacillus rotori, one of the components of a SIBO yogurt, has such great effect is uh, the evidence tells us that uh, in Western Europe, in the US, 96% of us have lost the species because of all those things, antibiotics, yeah. emulsifying agents, et cetera. So uh, less than fewer than one out of 20 people actually retains lactobacillus rotor that you were supposed to get from mom as you mm -hmm. pass the birth canal, breastfeeding, et cetera. And of course, mom may, maybe didn't have it to give it to you or you got antibiotics at age three for ear, uh, inner ear infections, et cetera. So we replaced lactobacillus rotori and uh, takes up resin's entire GI tract. And one of there's, there's some very elegant work that was done at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that showed that restoration of rotori 
causes via the vagal nerve, your brain to release oxytocin, the hormone of love and affection and closeness. So Ivor, so we, we make this yogurt, it doesn't have to be SIBO yogurt, it could just be Rotori yogurt too. And we get these really high counts by prolonged fermentation. People eat the yogurt and they say, you know, I like my spouse better. I like my coworkers. I like my family better. I introduce myself to strangers in line for coffee at Starbucks. So it's at a time, Ivor, pre-pandemic, even putting aside the pandemic, of record social isolation, suicide, divorce. People are saying, you know, I, I, I want the company of other people. I introduce myself to strangers. So it's really changing things. And it reduces skin wrinkles because oxytocin causes deposition, an explosion of dermal collagen. It also restores youthful muscle and strength. So when I first made the yogurt, this goes back now a couple of years, I was pre-pandemic. I was going to the gym 15 minutes once a week. I hate going to the gym. I can't stand it. <laughs> so I go 15, 15 minutes once a week. With that minor effort, Ivor, I gained, people don't believe when I tell them, I gained 13 pounds of muscle and my strength went through the roof. I'm 64 and I'm, I'm lat pulling down 200 pounds for 10 repetitions, something I haven't done since I was 19 years old. So wow. restoration of youthful muscle and strength, because we lose muscle and strength as we age. So that gets restored. Yeah. Appetite is completely turned off. Food tastes great. Mm. But appetite is complete. And so you can walk by a plate of donuts at the office. Don't, couldn't care less. I'm a chronic insomniac. I sleep three, four hours, and I'm miserable during the day because I'm tired and crabby. Well, on the Rotary, I sleep nine hours straight through deep childlike dreams. Uh, and there's a whole other, a bunch of other. Now, some of this has been corroborated in humans. Some not, but one of the things I've done is I have my entire neighborhood making this yogurt. I have, ha I have thousands of people making the Reuteri yogurt and they, yes, wrinkles are disappearing. Strength goes up. Appetite is suppressed. Now there's some variation in these effects for unclear reasons, but there may be variations in the oxytocin receptor and some other genetic factors, but for the most part, restoring this lost that Ivor, that's one microbe. That's one stinking microbe, and you get this whole range of benefits, including, I think, probably preventing the development of SIBO. Rotori by itself, I don't think is sufficient to eradicate SIBO. That's why we combine with those other microbes in the SIBO yogurt. But I think it's enough. So what we do after eradicate, eradicating SIBO is we make this the Rotori yogurt to prevent recurrences. And, and I think it's effective. We have yet to prove that formally but I think it's effective in preventing the common recurrences of SIBO. All of, all of what you observed is based on the three component one. I think you mentioned you also just sometimes have just the single one, the rotary, but, but generally what you're using is the triple one everywhere, is it? So the three species yogurt, the lactobacillus gasseri, lactobacillus rotari, and bacillus coagulans, that we use for eradication of SIBO. Though you could consume it long term, also I, I know of no harmful effects of this thing. But if you if if the ladies go berserk for this stuff, Ivor, because once they hear, I, I talk to ladies about this, and they say we don't care about the muscle, we don't care about the empathy, we just want smoother skin. I'm like, what? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's what they tell me. Uh, <laughs> so well, a lot of a lot of people just make the Rotori yogurt, which by the and, and there's other effects by the way. There's an increase in the immune response. Now, this was seen in mice, not yet corroborated in humans. I don't know if we'll have the ability to corroborate that in a clinical study. But one of the things that happens in, so as you and I age, one of the things that happens is the thymus gland right here in front of the heart in the anterior mediastinum. The thymus gland reaches its maximum size and T cell immune production at age 15. 15, Ivor. So you, I, I, you and I are older than 15. So as, as we age, the thymus gland atrophies, it shrinks, mm. such that by age 70, it's only 10% of its prior volume and T cell producing capacity. That's, that's a big part of the reason why people die of the flu at age mm. 70 or pneumococcal pneumonia uh, because of the loss of the thymus. Well, Rotori via oxytocin restores thymic 
volume and T-cell producing capacity. It reverses so-called thymic involution or atrophy. Now that has yet to be proven in humans, but it occurs vigorously in mice. It's another, but if you think about this, Ivor, reversal of thymic involution, reduction of skin wrinkles, increased dermal collagen, restoration of youthful muscle and strength, preservation of bone density. I didn't mention that one. Deeper sleep, increased libido, increased testosterone in males, increased growth hormone. These are all effects from the oxytocin. If you add it all up, it's an age reversing effect, which is the, one of the creepiest things you'll ever see. It was a series of studies from Stanford. And it was a series of studies meant to document what happens in something called heterochronic parabiosis. Really creepy studies where they took a mouse or a rat, they cloned it. So it was genetically and immunologically identical. And so they take an old mouse, clone it, they have a new young mouse, and they connect their circulatory systems. Yeah, their arteries and veins. <laughs> and the old mouse becomes young. The old mouse becomes young. Yeah, you might have heard this. It's really I, creepy. It so was, it, what, what, what mediators were responsible for this effect. Not all mediators have been identified. There were several peptides that were identified and oxytocin. Mm. So that's what got me thinking about oxytocin. What? You know, oxytocin is often regarded as nothing more than this thing you give to a pregnant mom who wants to deliver her child and it causes uterine contraction. But it's, it's not just that. It's so much. That's one of the great revelations of the work that came out of MIT and elsewhere. That this hormone oxytocin, and we've lost roiteri that causes you to release oxytocin. So we've found a way, because you can take oxytocin as an intravenous injection. No one's going to do that. It only lasts three minutes, by the way. There are people using intranasal oxytocin, like in autistic children. They're using it in uh, marriage counseling because it encourages seeing the other person's point of view, but it only lasts about 90 minutes. You end up having to squirt all the time. So it's impractical. So what we've uh, found in the way of Reuteri is a way to circumvent all the problems, the loss of Reuteri, the short acting duration of intravenous or intranasal inhalation of, of oxytocin, because we restore the microbe and you have 24 hours of oxytocin. I think that's what we're seeing now and seeing either an age reversing effect yeah that's fascinating and you know well it's you, you always want the body to do it itself it's like don't eat glucose let gluconeogenesis do it because your body will know with all the feedback loops just to pitch it just where it needs to be and this sounds very similar if you get and i'm guessing that ancestral humans all had the rotor eye generally speaking maybe not exclusively but they probably all had to a large degree in most areas of the world. And that probably somewhat managed wars and, and, and other difficulties as part of the mechanism you described. And of course, kept them healthy uh, and everything else. But the body, when getting the right inputs, and in this case, one of the correct inputs is the bacteria having your gut, can then go ahead and control things optimally across myriad factors, including the oxytocin. You're very good. Absolutely right. In the analyses we have of the microbiomes of hunter-gatherer populations, that is, people who are not taking antibiotics, who don't have emulsifying agents in salad dressing and ice cream, all that stuff, they mm -hmm. all have rotorite. Either they ah. all have lactobacillus rotorite. And if we were to assess the microbiomes of squirrels, of um, uh, foxes, of mm. other creatures they all have roteri. Most mammals have roteri, but not humans and not, not modern Western modern humans. And you know, that's interesting there because something just popped into my head, a pattern recognition. Uh, you just listed out carnivores and herbivores. Doesn't matter. They all have it. So it's not connected to meat eating or. Excellent point. Yeah. Which suggests that the roteri play some kind of crucial role for mammalian health, and yet we've lost it. But it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a great example, and there's a growing list of these uh, microbes that modern humans have lost, but we enjoy all kinds of great benefits when you restore it. 
Um, Another one is uh, Bifidobacter infantis. Uh, a lot of research at a uh, University of California, Davis in, in California. And um, so 90% of infants do not have it because mom didn't give it to them or mom got an antibiotic as often happens during both vaginal and C-section delivery. The child gets antibiotics to prevent beta streptococcal infections. Uh, so mom may not have had it to pass on to the child or it was eradicated by antibiotics. So 90% of infants don't have Bifidobacter infantis. If you restore it, particularly the, be- the evidence is best for uh, a strain called EVC001, which is commercialized as a pro- uh, something called Avivo, E-V-I-V-O. Well, when the baby is, this microbe is restored, they're more likely to sleep through the night. They take longer naps. The number of bowel movements are reduced from about four on average to two, meaning mom and dad have to change fewer diapers. And as older children, seven, eight, nine years old, they have less asthma, less type one diabetes, less autoimmune diseases, and have higher IQs. In other words, restoration of this one microbe has lifelong implications for that child. Uh, and it, it, it takes a, the reason why it works is because uh, women who breastfeed, <clears throat> there's something called human milk oligosaccharides that are present in breast milk, not present in formula, by the way. Formula is a huge disaster. Oh. <laughs> it, it's sugar and vegetable oils. It's just shocking what's in that junk. Yeah, it sorry. really is. Yep. So uh, uh, when a baby has bifidobacter infantis, it is able to digest to human milk oligosaccharides. Humans aren't able to digest them, only microbes. And so like, like Infantis. So when Infantis is restored, the baby is able to metabolize, thereby use the nutrients, the, the uh, calories, et cetera, in the human milk oligosaccharides. And that baby has a neurodevelopmental advantage when they get, mm-hmm. and, it, and that Infantis, oddly, in newborns comes to occupy about 90% of the microbiome. So you can imagine if the child doesn't have that microbe, their microbiome is typically uh, dominated by hospital microbes, stuff on people's skin, nurses' skins, uh, beds, uh, sheets, uh, hard surfaces, and, and uh, this is a big problem. So, but it's another example, Ivor, of the power of restoring microbes that humans were supposed to have but have lost. Yeah, absolutely, and you know. Infantis, it was, that was named after the fact that it was the dominant microbe of inf- infant humans. Is that- mm-hmm. Yeah, so, humans, so, adults have it too. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, but, but just by the naming, it obviously was a big deal and a big part of, of infants uh, many years ago. So we know with absolute fact now that this thing, 90% don't have it now. That's a major red flag. Uh, among a sea of red flags, I think, to be quite honest these days, yeah. And you know, so the company that sells this, and by the way, I have no relationship with the company, don't know mm. them, I, ha- I have talked to them, but um, uh, they tell moms to take their probiotic mixture, it comes in a sachet or a, or a jar, little jar, and you mix it with breast milk and you feed it to the baby. But I say, you can do better than that. Why not have pregnant moms? make the yogurt with it. It makes a delicious yogurt. We use prolonged fermentation for multiple doublings and get very high counts in the hundreds of billions. The, the uh, Vivo product, I think provides something like, I think it's 8 billion or something like that. It sounds like a lot, but when you're talking about microbes, you really want hundreds of billions, maybe trillions uh, to really have a biological effect. And so I've been telling ladies, well, make the yogurt consume it during your pregnancy or even before pregnancy so that when you give birth to your baby, it passes through the birth canal, you breastfeed it, you give the baby infantis in the context of a mother's microbiome, which I think makes more sense than just giving it. You can still give it to the baby, but why not do it and restore this microbe Mm -hmm. and give it to your child the way it was supposed to have occurred all along? Well, you know, and that reminds me of Professor Hollis, who gave that incredible talk many years ago and did the experiment with vitamin D with the pregnant mothers. And he proved to the medical system, uh, much to their horror, that you're giving vitamin D to the babies because babies are all deficient. Did you ever stop to think why they're deficient? And he showed that you had to give the mother 6,500 IU per day 
for the breast milk to have the D3 that kept the baby sufficient. But the medical system wants to give the mother 800 and also supplement the baby instead of going the real route. So a similar kind of thing. And you know, well, this dish yogurt then, I mean, you can get that commercial product you mentioned with the Infantis and you can make your own. And the other three, have you got a system now or a product available or distribution to buy the yogurt? Or how do people do this now and take action? Well, right now, you know, it's, some people get overwhelmed when we talk about the lost microbes or restoring lost microbes. But I tell people, you know, if you go into a restaurant and the waitress or waiter hands you a menu, you don't say, oh, my God, I have to order all these appetizers and main dishes and side dishes and desserts. No, you, you pick the ones you want. You pick the appetizer, you pick the main dish and maybe dessert. That's it. Same thing here. It's like ordering from a menu at a restaurant. Choose the microbes until we have better wisdom, perhaps. Maybe there's a better way to do this. But until that happens, look at it like a restaurant menu. If you want deeper sleep or restoration of youthful strength and muscle and smoother skin, make rotary yogurt. If you want better recovery from strenuous exercise, I have a tennis pro daughter who uh, had a concussion a couple of years ago and couldn't play, couldn't, couldn't uh, play nor practice for about a year. She comes back, she dropped off the charts in her ranking from number 28 in the world to nothing, <laughs> had to qualify. So when she went to Wimbledon or French Open or US Open, she had to qualify. And qualifiers are tough because you play every day, unlike the every other day of the main draw. So you play in the qualifying round, you beat your opponent, you're exhausted. 90 degree weather, three hours, right? Got to do it again next day. You win, got to do it again next day if you win to the main draw. So by the time you get to the main draw, you are beat to heck, right? So uh, take Bacillus coagulans yogurt. You don't get sore because you reduce muscle injury dramatically. So in the last two years, uh, and then since she's uh, been taking Bacillus coagulans, she no longer gets sore, even after a three, three and a half hour match at 90 degree Fahrenheit weather. So that, uh, you could take bifidobacter infantis for your baby. So in other words, you can kind of order up like a menu, the effect you want by restoring this or that microbe. If you want to shrink your waist and don't want to change your diet or exercise, you can shrink your waist by taking bacilli, uh, uh, lactobacillus gasseri, two strains, the BNR17, the 2055 from Japan. Those strains reduce waist circumference by an inch doing nothing else over about three months over and over again you and i can choose a specific effect use the microbe to obtain those effects Clara, uh, this is a recent thing it's not in my books or anything i was playing with this idea of nootropics so I, for years and years 20 some years i've been playing with this idea of nootropics these are things that make you and me smarter cleverer more creative better memory for about four hours. <laughs> so your brain is not healthier. You're just a little bit, it's like caffeine, but a little bit more of an effect. So that's a nootropic. As by the way, compared to something called neurotrophics, those are things that actually make your brain healthier. There's a lot of confusion about that. You'll see a lot of supplement companies making the claim that they are healthier for your brain, which is nonsense. Most of those fact, factors that make your brain a little bit more effective for a few are, are not healthier for your brain. So there's yeah. a distinction between nootropic and neurotrophic. But there is a combination, nootropic and neurotrophic, with very few, called phenylethylamine. And it's produced by a microbial species called Lactobacillus brevis, which is present in some fermented foods, like fermented sauerkraut or kimchi or fermented meats, like soprasada or salami, some of them have in addition to the mm. microbes like uh, leuconostoc mesenteroides will also sometimes have this lactobacillus brevis and brevis produces phenylethylamine. So I made yogurt out of it <laughs> and it's delicious. And now this is just pure anecdote. So I don't know if, how true this will hold, but I've had a few dozen people do this. And some of us have reported uh, increase a nootropic effect, a little more effective, a little more clever, a little faster on your feet and happier. 
and I think it may be due to the production of phenylethylamine. I had to write this piece on skin health. It's not my area. I'm thinking, I'm dreading it, Ivor, because I'm thinking, oh man, I'm going to have to refresh my memory and all the studies on skin. It's going to take me hours to days to write, right? Not easy. So I sat down one evening, eight o'clock at night, right? Glass of wine here. I'm thinking, oh man, I'll just get started. 45 minutes, I wrote the entire thing. I, I finished. I stepped back and I said, what the hell just happened? <laughs> now, I have a proof of nothing. Proof of nothing. Hmm. But I wondered, could this have been a nootropic effect? And I also found that it makes you a little brighter. So I don't know if it's the phenylethylamine, but I, I, my, my point with all this is that we're learning new lessons every day, really cool lessons about bowel health, human functioning, human mental function, mood. You know, the rotary alone, I've really. Uh, so one of the studies I'd like to see performed is the U.S. government uh, is very concerned about the suicide rate in the U.S. It's done that in the last decade. Uh, I mean, for some obvious reasons like COVID-19, but there's other factors here. So suicide is out of control and they want to know what the hell's going on. Well, I, I think we could make a case for the loss of Reuteri and thereby oxytocin underlying at least some mm. of, of these effects. And so we have a study planned to look at one, do people who have suicidal ideation with recent sui suicide attempts, do they have, are they less likely to have Reuteri? Do they have lower levels of oxytocin? And can we reverse that suicidal ideation by restoration of rotary and oxytocin? So I, 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 we are on to, I think, not me, just alone, I'm, I mean, as a society, on to some really cool new lessons, all deriving from insights into the microbiome. Yeah, and you know, it's really exciting stuff. And I wish I had more time to look into it over the years, but I haven't. But now... I'm, I'm cutting, cutting a shortcut by talking to you, Bill. <laughs> I'm finding out all this stuff. But you know, Brevis, Infantis, uh, Rotary, I'm just trying to keep track of some of the names here and I list them all. Uh, when I release this podcast, I list them down below. And like you say, it's a menu. Maybe we can list them and give a couple of um, kind of associated factors that are with them, like, I don't know, mental health or positive outlook or maybe uh, as you said, infantus for breastfeeding mothers. Do a simple cheat sheet. But you know, the next question then will be, um, like say in Ireland, uh, people listening to this, though they listen around the world, uh, where do they go to grab what they want uh, to make their yogurt? I mean, it doesn't sell in the supermarket, these different, uh, these different bacteria uh, cultures. Right, and that's a very important point, Ivor, that just buying yogurt at the grocery store does nothing no. No, the wrong microbial species, mm. um, abbreviated fermentation to, to hasten production. Yeah. You got to do this yourself. So that was my motivation for writing the super gut book. I give you, if you want this effect, do this. If you want this effect, do this. And there's some other things in there also. Uh, for instance, how to make what, what's what I call clove green tea, which has components that actually increase intestinal mucus production dramatically, which is part of healing. For instance, cloves are a source of the terpene eugenol, and eugenol causes proliferation of species of clostridia that in turn cause marked thickening of your mucus barrier. Mucus is productive. We're less than a millimeter away from intestinal destruction because of mucus. So even though it's, people say, oh, gross, you know, I cough it up when I had the flu <laughs> or I blow it out of my nose, but it plays a crucial role in, intestinal, in the intestinal barrier. So uh, the super gut book shows you all these kinds of things. Uh, we have to be able to, so uh, I, I obtain my microbes from commercial sources, from, from manufacturers. So I just spent last Friday at one of the world's largest commercial producers, but they don't sell to the public. So I, I look for microbes that people can buy, like the Avivo for Infantis, like the BioGaia gastris product. That's a source of a couple of the strains of Lactobacillus rotari. Uh, and there's a growing list of these kinds of things. The Brevis, the Brevis, you can, you know where I got mine from? I didn't get it from a manufacturer. I got it from a beer supply maker. 
ah. because so some of the uh, craft brewers will use it in their. I think it's. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't know much about beer. I think they use it in some of their ales or something to get a little edge of bitterness. Mm. I, was a little, I was a little surprised that uh, these brew brew companies would sell you the, uh, the Brevis. But that's how I got mine. That's the thing that I think has a nootropic and mood elevating effect. Uh, so we have sources like that, and it's growing all the time. But that's what I do in the Super Gut book. I show you if you want this, do this, get your microbe here. That. That's exactly it. So the super gut book basically, as well as explaining all of this in more detail so people internalize it, it basically gives you all the hacks to get it when you can't get access to commercial supply or indirect ways like maybe via sauerkraut. Um, so it gives all the linkages, all the patterns of, and so you can pick like you say from the menu, but also crucially gives you your way of accessing that. And of course, how to make the yogurt. I mean, I guess it's pretty simple to make yogurt. Uh, the key thing is what you put into it, the culture. Uh, but still, a lot of people would not be sure where to start to do this properly. So the book covers basically the whole spectrum, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the problems with a book, of course, is a book is static. And the Ooh. information coming out is coming out uh, at such a tidal wave uh, rate mm. that there's even new things I've learned since I wrote the book. For instance, I made Saccharomyces boulardii cider. So Saccharomyces oh. boulardii is a fungus. It's related. It's a cousin of the Saccharomyces cerevisiae that people use to make bread, sourdough bread, and beer and wine. Uh, but there's a, uh, a a Saccharomyces species adapted to the human body, and that's called boulardii. Saccharomyces boulardii. Well, it's, it's beneficial for a variety of uh, issues. It protects you from Clostridium difficile, that terrible uh, mm. after antibiotic condition, which is devastating. It protects you from a number of health conditions. And it also, also can prevent or even you be used as part of a treatment for uh, fungal overgrowth, which is another big problem for modern people. I made cider out of it. It was easy as heck. It, it ferments itself. It's such a vigorous CO2 producer. You have to vent your jar about twice a day or else the thing will explode. Produce, you can actually see it bubbling after 24 hours. It's producing so much carbon. But, but you know, Ivor, these are damn fun. <laughs> and, and you get all these incredible health effects by doing this. Yeah, and you know, Bill, I, I've always intended to get it. My wife does, she makes the kimchi and some other things. We're very busy, so it's sporadic. But I want to get into the the canning as well. You know these mason jars you evacuate, you can make a full chicken cordon bleu uh, dinner with herbs, put it in a jar, and I only discovered six months ago, yeah, you can can goods like meats and they last for years with no refrigeration. I didn't realize you can put a whole dinner in a mason jar, evacuate it with a special device, and it's good for three or four years with no refrigeration. I, I know that. I met a guy who does it. He runs an organic farm and he took one out and opened it up and there's a big smell of roast chicken. <laughs> and, wow. but, and I said, but no refrigeration. He said, no, it's the same as a can of meat, canning, oxygen taken out, and it's basically, it probably even longer than three or four years. So you could have a cellar full of all your favorite foods at, at dinners. Um, but then, of course, you've got the whole world of, of uh, sauerkrauts and kimchis, and then you've got all of what you've just touched upon, like making cultured yogurts that are kind of like superfoods in the true sense of the world, not like just eating, I don't know, what do they say is superfood? Kale or something. It's silly. Like, they pick one, you know, plant-based food, it's always plant-based, that's a superfood. I mean, eggs, organ meats, you know, fatty lamb, they're all superfoods. Uh, absolutely yeah. good for you I, 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 I couldn't, couldn't agree more you know the uh i think it's worse in the u.s i think uh europeans and asians are better at including fermented foods in their diet here it's terrible it's mm. not uncommon for somebody to have absolutely zero fermented foods in their diet whether it's mm. kimchi kefirs yogurts fermented veggies sauerkraut etc uh, but, you know, ever since 1927, when commercial, when refrigeration became a household item mm. and people thought that fermented foods, that soupy, slimy looking mix was unhealthy, thought it was rotten. No, it's good for you, as you point out. And you, you got to wonder, 
if, you know, one of the lowest incidences of coronary disease in the world is in South Korea. The people who consume kimchi many times per day, you got to wonder, it's, it, that, that's not proof of cause and effect, uh, of course, but you got to wonder if a big piece of health is consumption of fermented foods and recent study from Stanford from Justin and Erica Sonnenberg, husband wife team, they demonstrated that compared to prebiotic fibers that nourish microbes, fermented foods hands down have a far bigger effect. So we've got to re-embrace fermented foods. Yeah, and again, yet again, it's no surprise that humans, now I know it was, as you mentioned there, it was for keeping food, that's true, but all through human evolution, nearly every different uh, indigenous peoples had their different fermented foods all over the world, they had their own type. And in Asia, yeah, it, I saw a documentary recently, there was a market just for fermented foods and like sauerkraut style things, but it gets more expensive the older it is. And the very expensive vat they open up, it was very expensive. I think that was 21 years. That, that batch. Yeah, yeah. They had like six months, 12 months, 20 years batch. And that's the really expensive stuff. Now, I'm sure it's probably quite pungent or an acquired taste, perhaps, that stuff. But like those guys, it's, it's part of their culture. And I agree with you. Given all the science around this that's exploding, along with the lack of bad foods and the lack of other problems and, and, and probably, you know, glyphosate, etc., but along with that, they have all these cultures of these things that are now turning out to be highly likely to be beneficial and even highly likely to be super beneficial. So is that, is that book relatively recent? And I'm sorry, Bill, I'm so caught up in the corona stuff. I, I'm kind of out of touch with reality of what else is going on in the world. But uh, how recent is the book, the super? So it comes out February 1st, 2022. So it's not even out yet. So it's people not they can pre-order it, you know, that thing that they do now, pre-ordering. You can do that, um, uh, uh, but it comes out February 1st. February and, 1st. And I, hope, I hope it's, you know, I've been blacklisted from all major media because of my <laughs> undoctored book. Uh, as, by the way, have uh, people like you and me who speak our mind about the problems in healthcare are no longer welcome in U US, US, because there's direct consumer drug advertising, six, a $6 billion a year industry. Now all major networks and print media have committees of people who decide whether your message is appropriate on a venue that has drug advertising. And guess what? If you and I say things like drugs are stupid, they're predatory, big pharma, we're no longer welcome. So. Uh, we're having it. To, I'm, I'm so I'm very grateful to to you, other people with podcasts who sh who spread this message. It's a message of health, because in especially in the U.S., you cannot broadcast a message of health on TV or print media anymore. Yeah, it's it's a sick care system, not a health care system, as one of the phrases yeah. goes. And the US is particularly bad, but to be honest, Europe is catching up the last 10 years. I've been watching it. Uh, it's, it's just getting really nuts. And censorship now, we were allowed to argue about statins. We were allowed to argue about the data. Um, you got a lot of pushback. You might have got not covered by commercial platforms, but, but you were allowed to talk about it. And the last year and a half being involved in the corona, just through sharing actual risk ratios, infection fatality rates, comparing to Spanish flu or to other epidemics in the past, just having a rational, calm kind of uh, perspective on COVID-19. It's a tough virus and it's been very sad for a lot of people, particularly elderly, immunocompromised. But I found the censorship astonishing and even media attacks and newspapers and everything. So this, this phenomenon attached to COVID is, is quite a very new thing, even though it's in the same mode of what we've seen in the past. Uh, but anyway, we, we, we won't get into that here or, or this video will be taken down. <laughs> That's why your podcast, my podcast, Defiant Health, other people's podcasts, because they're not subject to censorship yet. Yes. Yeah. We're yeah. allowed to speak our minds, even if it's contrary to the... Uh, designs of big pharma and healthcare.
Yeah, that's it. And we well anyway, the one thing I am I think I'm still allowed to say this though, uh, covidchroniclesmovie.com. We have our own website, so luckily it's independent. Um, but that ain't gonna be picked up by any movie sites. Uh, do you remember Donal O'Neill who made serial killers? That viral video. He's an Irish guy, he made a few films with um Dr. Asim Malhotra as well, the crusading cardiologist, kind of anti-statin in the UK. So Donald's a great guy. Uh, he's 10 years in low carb. But yeah, we made a movie and we got 180 grand on Kickstarter. So we actually were able to make a proper movie. And the only people we interviewed as experts uh, were pretty much all professors of immunology, you know, of cardiology. So it's totally clean. Um, but anyway, but I, yeah, it, it won't get distributed by anyone significant. But here, this is, this is great, Bill. And that gut stuff, you know what you've reminded me as well? Uh, I get the book as soon as it comes out or whenever the pre uh, uh, is ready. Um, I need to get going on some of that stuff. You know, I'm pretty low carb. I'm reasonably good, but I'm not optimizing and enhancing. I'm just kind of steering clear of bad stuff. And I, I should be doing more. <laughs> yeah, one thing to know, Ivor, is uh, the mistakes being made by the ketogenic community. This makes people mad at me. I'm sorry. Mm. I'm not doing it to sell you something. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the ketogenic diet is one of those areas where there's actually abundant data because it was used since 1920s in children with intractable uh, brown mal seizures. Yeah. yeah, and it works. It reduces seizure frequency, 50, 60%, something like that for these poor kids who can't stop having seizures and can get brain damage from it. Now, in the early years, they added corn oil, which is a very bad idea. More recently, they're using things like uh, medium chain triglycerides, MCT oil, coconut oil, olive oil. So it's, it's evolved over the years. But it's for that reason, we have lots of evidence in uh, children on ketogenic diets, as well as adults on ketogenic diets. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that occurs, so unless you purposefully include prebiotic fibers that nourish bacteria in your ketogenic diet, if you don't do that, there's a very weird phenomenon that occurs. There's a proliferation of acromantia, uh, a specific microbe. So in you and me who are not ketogenic, have three to four to five percent of all your microbiome occupied by acromantia eosinophila. Mm. If you fail to take in prebiotic fibers that acromantia likes, other microbes die off or drop in numbers. Acromantia has the added capacity to feed on human mucus. Acromantia eosinophila, mucus lover. And it expands to 12%, 18%, 24% of all microbes in your GI tract and starts to consume you. It eats the mucus barrier in your colon, small bowel, and you get inflammation, colitis, diverticular disease, increase in colon cancer, endotoxemia because of destruction of the mucus barrier, and then autoimmune diseases, neurodegenerative. So all these people all hell bent on a ketogenic diet Short term, okay, but long term, nasty mm -hmm. stuff happens. And I'm seeing it play out, by the way. So the key is you can be ketogenic intermittently, but be sure to get those things that nourish microbes and keep acromantia happy with fibers mm. rather than human mucus. Yeah, for sure. And you know what? Instinctively, without having the benefit of that specific knowledge, myself and Dr. Gerber in our book, Eat Rich, Live Long, and ourselves instinctively, and knowing all the science, say, if you wanna do keto, go in and out of keto by fasting, by skipping meals, because fasting raises beta-hydroxybutyrate, it's good for your neuro neurological health. So add a thing like fasting, don't add in sticks of butter to force up the fat to, to achieve ketosis. Just skip some meals, Eat low carb, healthy low carb, and healthy low carb absolutely would include fermented products and low starch vegetables um, and all those things. Now, again, I have good friends in the carnivore community and the hardcore keto, but I don't think there needs to be any tension. My particular view is low carb with these beneficial things we talk about and skip meals uh, to get the benefits of fasting and also to go into ketosis in a cyclic way 
which is so human evolutionary, isn't it? I mean, humans had to fight for food. They often didn't have much. They ate whatever they could get. It just fits the evolutionary pattern, which I love. Yes, well said, Ivor. A- absolutely. And, and it, makes, it makes sense in, in, in the context yeah. of human adaptation and evolution. I, I agree, absolutely. Excellent, Bill. Well, I know you've got tons of things to be doing. Uh, I'm just sitting in my little cottage here in the middle of nowhere. I probably have more latitude. So uh, when the book is available for pre-order now, I'll put the links down below, but is it on like Amazon and the usual ones or your website more so? or? Yeah, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, uh, your local bookstore. Yeah, all those, all those places. Perfect. Well, let's hope we get you some sales anyway. But most of all is to get the word around and have the people, like you say, getting healthier and happier by understanding more and having more knowledge and more tools at their disposal. And that's what it's all about. Absolutely. Thank you, Ivor. Thank you so much, Bill. Till next time. And you'll see in the appendix, there's a list of those kind of recipes. If you want this, do this. If you want this, do this. Yeah, I will need a device. Hmm? You will need a device to keep uh, most of these microbes prefer human body temperature. Not all of them, but most of them prefer human body temperature. So you need a device that can keep it around 37 degrees Celsius. So like a sous vide device or a yogurt maker. Uh, One of the problems we have with yogurt makers is they're sometimes preset to suit the temperature requirements of conventional yogurt, which can be as high as 114 degrees. And that kills a lot of our microbes like roiterize. So if you do have a conventional yogurt maker, you want to let it run for a while with a thermometer in it, see what the temperature is, or get one that has adjustable temperature and time. Uh, So, but you just need a device to keep it at around human body temperature, or even better, that can be adjusted to suit the microbe. Like that bacillus coagulans I told you about, that keeps you from having muscle uh, breakdown and uh, accelerates recovery. That microbe likes 115 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So be nice if, if that interests you to have a device that you can set to that temperature. Excellent. And you know what, Bill, even though we, we wrapped up the pod, I'm going to add this. I'll add this piece in afterwards because this is okay. perfect also. <laughs> okay. Perfect little snippet at the end. Hey, folks, hope you enjoyed that informative session with William Davis, MD. And I'll put a link in the description box below to his upcoming book on the microbiome. And please remember to give us a thumbs up if you can and to subscribe, of course, and hit that little notification button too. As always, I really appreciate my Patreon and PayPal supporters. And that's what enables me to do all the work on this platform, on my interviews, editing, on Odyssey platform, where I cover more of the viral material, uh, and indeed everything else I do to help counter some of the corporate and media narrative messages and apply technical expertise to getting to the core of the data and sharing that in an understandable form. So huge appreciation and it means so much and enables me to stay on my mission. So thank you.